Sure. I think so too. So it is 6.32 p.m. and we're going to call this um, Montpelier Roxbury Public School Board meeting to order. Um, first on the agenda is public comment. Do we have any members of the public in person who would like to comment? Online who would like to comment? No public comments this evening. What do we know about online? Okay. Over there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Cool. Oh, okay. Any, I just want to make sure we give this public comment space. It's it's due. Any any board members have any any questions, concerns related to public comment, or can we move forward? All right. We so need to define public comment every meeting. Okay. Okay. <laughs> especially when there are no public comments. <laughs> our, our chivalrous chair is here. Yes. Jim, we started, we started just to keep things moving along. Um, consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda? I'd like to move that we approve it when we take out the minutes okay. of the 818 meeting and have a very minor edit. Yes, yeah, so the motion is to approve the consent agenda without the 818 minutes so that we can discuss that. Do I have a second? I second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those against? The ayes have it. All right, Jill, 818. Um, I was not here, but I was listed as present. I was having a really nice time, but I was not at the board meeting. <laughs> that was all, thank you. We can take that out. So, so do I make a motion to amend the minutes from 818 to reflect that edit? Okay. I'll make that motion. I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. And then uh, do we have a motion to approve those amended minutes? Well, I move to approve the amended minutes of the 818 school board meeting. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All right. Jim, I'm gonna pick it for you now. Yeah, perfect. Um, <laughs> again, sorry, I'm a little late. Uh, two things to uh, add to the agenda. Um, one, we're gonna have a brief executive session uh, prior to adjournment um, for the purposes of personnel. And then secondly, um, one making announcements, it should also be on the website and going out to uh, students who have uh, the families of students in Roxbury, both at RVS, uh, also at the middle school and high school, which is uh, unfortunately, Jerry Huck uh, had to resign um, due to work obligations. Uh, I just want to, we forgot to do this last time, but publicly thank Jerry for her service. She served very thoughtfully and very diligently um, on the board uh, and we really miss her. And, leaves a big hole again, um, where, uh, which we'll need to fill. Um, so we are asking for uh, Roxbury citizens, this is a Roxbury seat, to uh, please, um, you can either write me or Libby, um, the emails are on the website, with your expression of interest. Um, and then at the next meeting, uh, we'll go through the letters of interest we have, uh, give any potential candidates a chance to briefly introduce themselves to the board. Um, and then at some point during that meeting, we'll go into executive discussion and make uh, an appointment to fill out um, the, well, Jerry's term till the next election. And then that person or uh, someone else um, will have to run for uh, the remainder of Jerry's term, which I have to admit, I'm not sure how much she has left on her on the website you can find yeah. out right? i think she was coming up next huh? i think it was coming up next march or next week. so she's finishing so down her just, yeah. okay um so you'd have to run anyways so um yeah so uh and if you uh want any more information uh please feel free uh to reach out to i think any of the board but me in particular i'm sure we would also be happy to uh, chat with you about uh, what what service entails, and um, just ask any other or answer any questions you have. Um, Jim, I'm sorry to interrupt. Is, does that mean that there might be someone trying to participate? Is, 
Mm -hmm. I don't know if maybe that's spam, but yeah. Hold on. Is the order received? It just says there's someone waiting in the waiting room for the Zoom call. Yeah. Using the phone. I'm texting okay. Anna right now. Thank you. <laughs> Good catch. Good. Um, so I think with that we can move on to board discussion, which is uh, budget priorities, routines, and timelines. Um, and also uh, after that, an RFP for district visioning work, um, but. Grant, take it away, please. Before Grant starts, Anna says there must be a lag between what okay. she's doing at home and what you see on the screen. So okay. Just know that she's on it. Okay. Right. I think I have a quick question. Yes. yes. Um, is there a way for us to like look at um, the doctors from Porch Forum and oh, absolutely. over there and all that yeah, stuff? Yeah, definitely. Yeah, um, happen, like, a, is there like a local paper over there? I don't know. I think Kristen is already going to um, put it on Rockford's front porch forum. Um, but yeah, no, any um, any other social media you have that um, or kind of informal networks you have definitely put out word as, as broadly as possible. Grant? Yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, we just started the 21-22 school year and it feels a little strange, but we're gonna start talking about the 22-23 budget. Um, before I get started, I did wanna introduce Christina Kimball right behind me. Christina was the business manager for um, Washington Northwest and then most recently Caledonia Central. She is now ours. She works as the payroll manager and is also acting as the assistant business manager and she's making sure that she knows all the processes. Since this is my last year, we wanna make sure somebody knows how we run budgets, how we run audits, all those things. So it's to be a smooth transition. Um, you should have all received a three-page budget discussion document, and that's what I'm gonna run through tonight. And at the end, there'll be plenty of time for questions or discussion. Um, the document, begins by outlining the budget process. Um, we're at the beginning stages right now. We built a calendar over the summer, and this is um, our meeting tonight to provide some information to you and get some feedback and or guidance. Um, the most significant or the first, I should say the first significant data point that we get for the budget process is our October 1 student count, which I will use to develop a, um, an enrollment projection that enrollment projection comes in handy when we start talking about staffing levels. The enrollment projection and budget worksheets are gonna go out to the principals and other administrators in early October. Um, principals will work with their staff to develop budgets and they will also provide input to other administrators for other kinds of requirements. For example, if they have facility issues, they will contact Andrew LaRosa. If there's special education needs, they'll go to Bill Dice. Um, if there are tech needs, they will talk to Mike Berry, although Mike is going to be pulling some double or triple duty this year since he is acting as the middle school principal. Um, the leadership team is going to meet several times to go over the staffing requirements and budgets, and eventually the idea is that we come to a consensus before we bring a budget to you in December. To meet statutory deadlines, the board has to approve the budget by mid-January. Um, we will present the budget one final time during the informational hearing, which is the day before town meeting, so February 28th this year, and then town meeting day, which is March 1st, is when the communities will vote. The next thing on this uh, document is statewide factors. Um, and as you know, from the last time we went through a budget, um, some of these statewide factors actually have a larger impact on the budget than our increase or decrease in budgeted numbers. Um, for example, a change of $100,000 in the budget is about a penny on the tax rate, um, but a change of $100 on the dollar yield 
is a change of 1.5 in tax rate. A change of 10 students, an increase or decrease of 10 students is a penny and a half on the tax rate. And a change of 2% on the common level of appraisal is a change of 4 cents on the tax rate. So in all of those examples, everything resulted in a higher tax rate change than $100,000 in budget. Um, so it's important to kind of understand these different factors, and I will go through all of them in a second. I did want to start out, though, with an opening paragraph on COVID-19 and federal funding, which have obviously had major impacts over the past few years and will continue to have impacts in the future. Um, I think ESSER three funds will be available all the way through, I think, September 30th, 2024. Um, so at least that long. We've already received about $800,000 in uh, federal funds via corona relief, coronavirus relief funds, which I will be re referring to as CRF, and also in elementary and secondary schools emergency relief or ESSER funds. Um, we anticipate much more ESSER funding as well as federal special education funds and possibly federal infrastructure money. Um, so we'll see how that goes. We are using uh, some of the ESSER money to fund three math interventionists and a community liaison. That you're gonna see probably as part of the FY23 budget. Um, we're also paying for some additional ventilation work and professional development, but there's still a significant amount of money that's left to spend. And we will have to determine the best use of that money. And at the same time, be careful not to avoid a large revenue cliff because if revenues drop, it's the same impact to tax rates as if expenses are increasing. So just something to keep in mind. Is there any way for us to be able to project those documents to the viewers at home and on ORCA while you're speaking, just for, to follow along? Thank you. And when that comes up, we're still on page one. Um, the first statewide factor that I wanted to talk about is the dollar yield. And that is the factor that is used um, as a comparison point to um, our spending per pupil. So if both the dollar yield and our spending per pupil increase by the same percentage, then the tax rate would remain level, or at least the pre-CLA tax rate would remain level. Sorry, I have to always look at you when I say CLA. <laughs> um, Unfortunately, we won't hear anything regarding the dollar yield until December 1st is when the tax commissioner puts out a recommendation. And even more unfortunate is we won't get a final dollar yield set by law until after town meeting day. So we always end up getting a budget passed before we even know what the real tax rate is gonna be. Um, the influx of federal funds and as Andrew will a firm uh, increases in sales and use in meals and rooms taxes um, might reduce the burden on property taxes. So we're actually hoping the yield will increase a little bit. So if the yield increases, then our spending per pupil can increase a little bit without impacting the tax rate. We're gonna start by assuming a, a yield probably of 11,500, which is about $200 more than FY22. Equalized pupils is the next factor. That's a two-year average student count that's adjusted by factors such as our free and reduced population, our English language learner population, um, the number of kids that are in preschool, the number of kids that are in high school. It's a very complicated formula. That formula may change soon, but as far as I know, it's the, still the same old formula that will be in play. Um, before COVID hit, as you know, our enrollment was on the increase. Um, due to COVID and its impact on attendance, we're assuming there's going to probably be some kind of a hold harmless provision statewide so that dis districts won't see this big drop in equalized pupils. Because if you have a big drop in equalized pupils, you have a big spike in tax rates. Um, it's going to be more important to other districts than us because we have pretty good um, enrollment. But even our district could have a decrease because you do have we had a lot of pre-K kids that um, didn't go to pre-K last year. Um, 
lower right. kindergarten enrollment. Um, the number of pre-K kids that we typically pay tuition for is about 100 this past year. I think it was like 58. So that will reduce our count. But if there's some kind of a hold harmless provision, then what we might do is we might just see that everybody gets to keep the same number. If it goes up, maybe we'll be able to keep the higher number. Or if it goes down, you may be held level. We're going to assume that we're going to hold level. So that's what we'll start with until we see some real numbers. Common level of appraisal or CLA. Ooh, I always struggle on this one. So basically that is a factor to adjust your property value. Um, and it's, it's your, the real value of your property versus the assessed value. Uh, it's based on a three-year average of sales date, data and that sometimes helps avoid large swings. What happens is if values, home values are going up like they are now, the CLA goes down and the tax rate goes up. So um, hopefully I've written that so you can cheat and look at it again later because it's, it's not intuitive. Um, we're gonna begin the budget process by assuming that the CLA is gonna drop about 2% in both communities. Although we are hearing that it could be a more dramatic drop um, because sales, it, since it's three years, usually you don't see a dramatic change, but the sales prices are so high that it might actually be dramatic, even though it's three years. Um, but we'll start with the 2% and we'll see how that plays out. Um, that is probably the biggest uh, tax factor because that 2% is probably a four cent tax increase if it goes down. If it's more than that, it could be even more dramatic. And I will also say that last year, I'm not really sure what the dynamic was, but Roxbury's CLA went up, I think four and a half percent, which was unexpected. So that good swing for the tax rate last year for, or this current year for Roxbury could be really bad next year. Uh, depending on what happens. I will say that I've, I've heard both communities are going to have a reappraisal soon. I know for sure that Montpelier is, but I've also heard that Roxbury might. When the reappraisal happens, basically your appraised value and your real value are the same. So the CLA is 100% and there is no change in the tax rate when that happens. So typically when you get a reappraisal, um, the CLA is going up and your tax rate goes down but your real tax amount that you pay is pretty much the same because it's a lower rate attached to a higher number for property value. Um, but the rates actually go down whenever a reappraisal happens. Uh, the next one is Act 46. Uh, for those of you who were here when we merged, whenever we merged, Act 46 allowed us to get a tax incentive. And that tax incentive was an eight cent reduction to the tax rate. Every year that dropped by two cents. Unfortunately, the way you could look at it is after year one, we've seen a two cent increase every year. I mean, that's really what you're having to deal with. Um, this year for, for FY23, that's the final year of, um, or actually it's the first year that we're not gonna have um, any kind of incentive. So we had a two cent incentive in FY22. There's no incentive in FY23. So this is the last year where we kind of see that in a way, two cent increase. After this year, it'll be flat. Uh, let's see, I do mention, I think in here that the impact of that two cents, uh, maybe I don't mention it. In order to, to kind of offset that two cents, you basically need to cut your budget by about $250,000. Um, cut the budget or increase your revenues, like your fund balance revenue. Let's see, where are we at now? Health rates. Um, for the past couple of years, the health rates have gone up about 10% on average. I'll assume the premiums go up another 10% this year, but I really don't know. I, I don't know how to, obviously COVID related expenses are high, but as we talked about at the finance committee, folks who would typically go to the doctor for routine issues are not going. So that may offset some of those other higher expenses. 
So we just don't know. Um, we will get something from uh, the Vermont Education Health Initiative, VHI, that's who we get our health insurance from. We'll get a number from them in November, which is usually a pretty good guess. Um, so by the time we have our first budget presentation, we should have a pretty good number in there for um, health premiums. Statewide health care bargaining is happening right now. Um, the current settlement runs through December of 2022, which is half of FY23. I don't think we're going to see anything come out from the, the uh, bargaining that's going to impact us dramatically. Um, we're pretty much aligned, and I think it's a pretty um, generous um, health care package for the state that we have now. So I can't imagine there's going to be a big swing. In addition to that, it's only going to be for six months of the fiscal year. So I don't think there's going to be a huge impact because of statewide health care bargaining. And the last thing on the list for statewide factors is Act 173. We've been talking about this for a while. That changes the special ed funding formula from basically a reimbursement model where we incur an expense and we get about 56% reimbursed back to us. It changes that model to more of a block grant where we get X number of dollars per student. Um, that was supposed to be in effect, I think definitely in FY22, maybe even in FY21. I'm hearing that it is supposed to be in effect for FY23, but I'm not 100% on that because I haven't heard for sure that it's happened. And I also haven't heard the details of what that model looks like. Like, for example, how do you define a kid? Is it going to be an equalized pupil? Is it going to be an average daily membership? Is it going to be um, students, a student count for special needs? I'm not sure. And I don't know what the dollar amount is going to be. So I'm just putting it on here because it could impact our revenues. So we could see, a, and for us, it would probably be a decrease. It would be an increase in certain areas like probably Burlington, um, Winooski, but for us, it would probably be a decrease in special ed revenues. That's the bad news. The good news is it allows us a lot more flexibility in how we spend special ed money. Um, the other good news is that we have been working um, to change, let's see, to, to align our systems uh, to increase effectiveness when kids need additional support. So we've known this is coming. We've been trying to posture for it. Okay, moving on. So those are statewide issues. Now I'm gonna get into kind of our district-wide pressures and opportunities, things that we know locally are, are gonna be an issue. Um, salaries are always a pressure because they make up a high percentage of the budget. So even a routine salary increase or pay raise is gonna be a pretty large increase in terms of dollars. Um, I will tell you that a lot of times in the budget process, we're having to assume a salary increase. We don't need to do that this year because our, our collective bargaining agreements are in place for all bargaining units through FY23. Staffing, staffing levels obviously impact salaries and benefits. Um, enrollment projections will help us kind of determine whether we should be looking at classroom staffing at all. Um, the high school might need a minor increase if the trends continue like they were last year. Um, the middle school has one grade cohort that is, a, that is a challenge. It's been real borderline as far as class sizes go. Um, other staffing needs beyond classroom teachers will be discussed by the leadership team if there's you know, any kind of custodial issues or uh, paraeducator issues, we'll talk about those things as a leadership team and bring those forward. Um, special education, that budget is going to be based on requirements that we identify as part of the service plan. That service plan is due October 15th. Um, but I will tell you, I spoke with, with Bill Dice, and um, he has had an uptick in special ed evaluation requests. So those could end up driving additional requirements in special ed for the coming year. Um, technology is on here as a pressure which 
kind of goes against logic a little bit. Um, you know, I'm sure that we spent a lot of federal funds on buying student devices. So you might initially think, well, we'll probably see a, a drop in needs for hardware. It doesn't quite work that way um, because if you have a whole bunch of devices, you also are gonna have a whole bunch of devices that are getting dropped that you're gonna have to replace on a routine basis. I don't think in FY23, we'll see that big increase because they're so new, um, but there might be a little bit of an uptick there. I think though hardware is probably something that you're gonna see in future years that might have an uptick. The last pressure that I list is food service. Um, COVID-19, I've talked about it before during quarterly reports, it's contributed to a larger than average food service deficit. Um, this year we budgeted, uh, in FY22, we budgeted a transfer of 100,000. Over the past two years, the average deficit has been more like 170. So uh, it might make sense to bump that up a little bit. On the flip side of that though, I certainly hope that by FY23, we're back to kind of normal food service operations and that we see the benefit of higher quality food with increased um, participation. And hopefully, you know, we'll see some improvement in the deficit numbers. I will say that in the near term, we have seen an even bigger increase in food service because we had to increase the hourly rate. We bumped it up to $15 an hour um, because we are having a real challenging time finding food service workers. Um, so something that I'll think about a little bit and then bring to you as a, as a, um, as a proposal, whether we need to bump this up any higher than 100,000. Um, on the opportunity side, we may be able to reduce some assumptions on the salary and benefit side because we've been coming in under budget. The fourth quarter report that you saw shows that we under-executed again, salaries and benefits. Um, what I can do in the FY23 budget maybe is to make some different assumptions, like assume that if we're gonna, if we have a vacancy for a teacher, assume they're gonna be a lower on the salary schedule. Assume that maybe they're only gonna have single health coverage. Cause right now they're pretty much on the higher end and I'm assuming two person coverage. Somebody could come in right from college, not needing health insurance, and that's a big swing. So I could make those assumptions. I could also reduce the assumption for how much we're gonna use, uh, how much the employees will use their health reimbursement arrangement. Um, this past year, the HRA use was really low because as I mentioned, unless you were really sick, a lot of people weren't taking the chance of going to the doctor. Um, so, We'll see how that plays out, but we could bump it down a little bit next year to see if, um, if we can save some money there. I mentioned staffing as a pressure, but it could be an opportunity as well, depending on how the staffing um, projections look. Um, we know that UES is getting to a point where their class sizes could be too small. I know that sounds strange to say, but there is an optimal class size for instruction. Um, but we'll have to see how that plays out. If it's not obvious, bless you. If it's not obvious, then we obviously we wouldn't be looking to make a reduction. But if it is obvious, and if we think that it's actually bad for instruction, we might be looking at reductions. Um, RVS class sizes are low. It's not really an opportunity or a pressure probably because I don't think we can do anything about it because the number of kids, the total number of kids is just too small. Even with multi-age classrooms, there's just so much you can do. Um, let's see what else we got. Um, tuition, high school tuition. We budgeted uh, $53,000 this year. That related to Roxbury kids who are grandparented with high school choice, that grandparented status goes away after this year. So that 53,000 we budgeted this year goes to zero next year. So at least we know there's 53,000 that we're gonna see as a savings. And the last opportunity I list is fund balance. Um, you know, we've had a very healthy fund balance. That healthy fund balance has got healthier, I guess that's a word. Um, because in FY21, we finished with a surplus again. Um, 
a lot of that has to do with just the, um, you know, the federal funding, the COVID impacts. It's hard to see how things were going to play out. For example, and I mentioned this, this example to the finance committee, it looked like we had overspent $265,000 in hardware, which was deficit spending, I thought. But we actually received $415,000 in federal funds that paid for that. So really, instead of a deficit of 265, we actually came out ahead by 150 because we thought we were going to use local funds and we didn't have to because we had the federal funds. So those kinds of weird swings, um, in, in addition, like projects, facility projects, it looked like we were overspending, but that overspending related to the ventilation work, which we got fully funded. And we actually, out of local funds, spent a little less than we anticipated for facility projects. So there were a lot of moving parts. Um, if you want to get deeper into that, the fourth quarter financial report was included in your board packet. So you can look at that. If you still have questions, feel free to pass them along. Um, fund balance is always on here as an opportunity because <clears throat> taxes are based on education spending, not total spending. What that means is you have your total spending, you subtract out non-tax revenues to get education spending. So if fund balance, for example, is a non-tax revenue, if you have more fund balance revenue as a source, then that reduces your education spending, just like cutting your expense side. So any time that you have fund balance, it's a potential opportunity because you could bump up fund balance revenue in your budget. That's the good news. The bad news is if you do that and you can't afford to do it in the next year, you have this revenue cliff that you fall off of and the tax rate goes way up in the following year. So you have to be real thoughtful how you spend fund balance. Right now we're assuming probably 400,000 because that's how much we have this year, but we can tweak that. We can use it as a lever to help control tax rates. And I think I've talked quite enough for now. There is another section talking about proposed guidance, but before we get to that, I thought I would open it up to any questions that anybody has to this point. Thank you, Grant, Mr. Brown. Uh, questions for Grant? I have a few uh, just clarifications, uh, confusion. So when, a, when you get all these revenues, then that's not good even if you know like for example the COVID, or if you apply for a grant outside of that you were saying that the dollar yield increases how was that um that no. you said that, that sometimes it's not good if you, your revenue increases so much what like what, what where is the no, I'm, I'm always a, in favor of a lot of revenue. Um, that's a good thing. Yes, the, but what's the downside is yes. if you use revenue for um, like a recurring requirement, uh -huh. like say, say my salary, say this year we got a bunch of federal money and you decided to use that to pay for my salary. Uh -huh. Well, next year when that revenue goes away, unless I go away, yeah. then you've dropped revenue, but you still have the expense. So that's the problem with, with revenues is not when you get them, it's making sure that when you get them, you spend them in a way that it's not gonna create a problem later. And there's um, nothing related to the dollar yield that I just take my notes well. The dollar yield, the I think- increase of revenue? I think if there's additional revenue statewide, is, as long as it's helping to offset or relieve some pressure on the education fund, that's a good thing. Okay. That would allow the dollar yield to go up, which I know like CLA, you want it to go, uh, well, you want CLA to go up, you want the dollar yield to go up too, because in both of those cases, that means taxes go down. So revenue, as long as it's used for the right reasons and it helps to take off some pressure, then it's a good thing. And it would make our dollar yield go up, which means our spending can go up per pupil and as long as those are both going the same direction at the same rate, then the tax rate stays same, the same. That's what I was, thank you for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's so easy. <laughs> so easy. <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't, but I can ask a question. <laughs> I have a question. Don't feel pressure. <laughs> 
So you met, you talked about accent 173 and how um, that's used for um, special ed. Mm -hmm. um, and I was looking at the quarter four financial report and it looks like um, the ed spending was about 3.7, the budget uh, special ed education spending was 3.7 million. Is yeah, that which, can you remind me which one that was that intensive or was it extraordinary? It, in the, in the, Quarterly report is just one line special education, and that's it. Oh, for expenses. For expenses. So, oh, yes, yeah, yes. yeah. So, 3.7 is what we are spending on special education. Acts 173 brings in revenue against that. Is that right? So, it, yeah, Act 173 is would be state special ed, ed funding for us to cover requirements we're already getting it, it's just a different model. So right now, um, some things will change and some won't. For example, if we have state place students, we're gonna get 100% reimbursement. I think under the new model, we still will get 100% for state placed expenses. For extraordinary costs, I think under the new model, we'll still get a higher percentage of reimbursement for extraordinary costs, like over $60,000. But most of the money we get is called intensive. And what that means is if you have a special ed teacher, um, that cost might be $100,000 with salary and benefits and everything else, right? Just to make it an easy number. We would submit that as an expense and the AOE would give us about 56% or $56,000 against that expense. The new model isn't gonna base it on reimbursement they're not gonna look at how much we're spending and give us a percentage of it. They're gonna just say, you have a hundred kids, we're gonna give you a thousand dollars per kid. So here you go. And then we don't have to track the expenses and submit for reimbursement. We have that money, we can use it how we feel is best serving students. Um, and so there's a lot more flexibility. The, the issue for us as Montpelier Roxbury is I think because of our demographics, we're probably going to see a, a, a reduction in how much money we're actually getting in special ed reimbursement. There's, I mean, I hate to use the, the phrase winners and losers, but every time there's a change in law, there are people who come out better and people who come out worse. I think this one is probably going to mean that we're going to see a little less revenues in special ed. Um, I, yeah, I was looking at those. So I was looking at the, the expenditure was 3.7. The special ed um, from the revenue side, the intensive was about 1.5, the extraordinary is about 400, and then the state place is about 18,000. So, so I was trying to add those up and see where the, you know, how much is it that we're getting reimbursed. Um, and that's the portion that's going to go potentially go down, is what you're saying, right? So I was trying to get those. Right. Points. When you look at all those revenue sources, like the state placed, mm -hmm. take that off the table, and extraordinary, take that off the table, because I think those will be the same. I think what's gonna be different is instead of a block grant and an intensive reimbursement, we're just gonna have one that's gonna be like a block grant. And I think the total dollar amount's probably gonna be a little less. Okay. okay. I mean, it, we actually probably would have made out this, this past year because um, we would have got X number of dollars that we could have used however we wanted. And so whenever we went into this pod model and we had a lot of special ed um, personnel doing general ed work, we wouldn't have had to worry about shifting those costs and then getting less reimbursement. We would have just got the number that we got. Um, but it, it'll be interesting how it works. We'll have to see. Um, my question sort of is related, but, and, I, and I, I get the sense that I'm gonna need an education on how special education funding works in the state of Vermont or federally. Um, but so when you talked about there is a potential increase in the number of students who will be identified as needing um, special education services, and that that could increase um, our budget. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, is there like a, so I think this is kind of what you were answering with Anakit, but is there a flat amount that we are reimbursed for those expenditures or how does it work? Yeah, well, <laughs> the, the, the good news is we may all need that um, tutorial because I think it's going to change. But right now, the way it works is 
everybody gets what's called a special ed block grant, which is uh, like for us last year, it was like 400 and some odd thousand dollars. So everybody gets a flat dollar amount just to cover expenses. Students are in the district. It's it's based on things like um, the number of kids and also average salaries gets factored in. It's a formula that's done by AOE. Mm -hmm. So we get this flat grant called a block grant. The next piece is called an intensive reimbursement, which is, and the percentage changes every year, but it's roughly 56%. So throughout the year, I submit reports to the agency of education and I show them how much money we've spent on special ed. Mm -hmm. And they give me basically 56% of that money back as a reimbursement. The other two pots are- state 50, 56, sorry. 56%, 56 50, about. Okay, thanks. The third pot is um, state placed. So if we have special education costs for state place students, we report that and we get 100% reimbursement for that. I think that is gonna be the same for the new model. I don't think they're gonna change that piece. And then the last piece is called extraordinary expense. So if, if we have a, a student who's in a, a placement and by the end of the year, the total cost is say $100,000. From zero to $60,000, we're getting reimbursed 56%. Once that student hits $60,000, we get 95% reimbursement from that dollar amount up. Mm -hmm. That I think is gonna be similar. I think there's still gonna be a, a way for us to get a higher level of reimbursement for extraordinarily expensive students. But those first two, the block grant and the intensive reimbursement, those two, I think, are going to be combined into one kind of block grant instead of two different pots. And it'll be X number of dollars times X number of kids. And I just don't know what those two X's are. And what can you explain what state placed means? Sure. If, if, like, say, some, say a kiddo is in DCF custody and they, um, they, are serviced by us as the LEA, then that would be a state-placed student. Um, there's, there can also be, um, trying to think of it, there's a facility, I think, that's in the bounds of Montpelier. Onion that, River. What's that? Onion River. Onion River. So some kids get placed there, and because they're placed there in our area, and if we provide services, then all of the expenses that we incur get reimbursed. <laughs> Okay, if, <laughs> if it's a special education student, if, if the student is just a, you know, is not on an IEP of any sort, then we may not get um, reimbursed for that. And are, are we also reimbursed at these same rates for 504 students? There's no reimbursement no. for 504. Okay. Yeah. I have a question on the dollar yield. One of the things that you um, have on page one in your um, notes was we begin the budget process assuming the yield will increase about $200. And then in parentheses, it's a, a, you've written 11,500. Can you say a little bit more about why 200 means 11,500? Because this year the dollar yield was about eleven thousand three hundred for FY twenty two. Oh, okay. So, I'm so that's it'll, it'll go, up go up to eleven dollars, which would put it at about eleven. Got it. 000. So it's not exactly a translation of a very intense calculation. No, it's more no, just we're adding two hundred dollars right. to what it was this year. Thank right. you. Mm -hmm. And that, like I said, the tax commissioner will come out with a recommendation that we. I mean, it comes out, it always comes out pretty much right on December 1st. Sometimes it's a day or two later before I get it. But um, early in the budget process, whenever we're presenting budgets, we'll have a pretty good number. Um, and then we have an inside person who sometimes can give us some tips on if we should make adjustments <laughs> to that assumption. Not naming any names. <laughs> I just had a real quick question. Um, Amanda's question prompted this and Mia's too. And I should know the answer, but are these revenues that we've gotten, these ESSER money and the CRF money, are they counted towards our per people spending? So for instance, are districts getting mm -hmm. dinged because their per people spending went up a whole bunch this year? Um, 
like versus oh, the yield? Good or? question. That is a very good question. Actually, um, the answer is we don't get dinged for it. Okay. Because um, remember, I mentioned before that a lot of times I put things in terms of education spending because it doesn't matter what your total budget's doing because you could have revenues that are offsetting a lot of that. So really it's the education spending that counts. Okay. And our spending per pupil is education spending per equalized pupil. Okay. And so that spending that we're having with federal money is also being subtracted because it's a revenue. So you spend 500,000, but you got additional revenues of 500,000. So your education spending didn't change. Okay. So it wouldn't hurt us at all. Thank you. Hmm. <laughs> oh, that's what you meant? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Sometimes you have to well, hit it's me a because few times. I didn't know the other part of the question that I was trying to figure out. <laughs> I was like, I have it in my notes. I do have um I know you've mentioned this several times about the again my accent, pupil waiting studies. I know that there's a working group that's working on that. And I'm just wondering, um and I, and I know you always say, you know, we will be one of the losers when this, if the weight is, is changed. And so I'm wondering how to like plan for that. Like, how do you plan for something like that ahead? That's and is sad. that going to impact the 20, the, our next budget cycle? Because they're planning to finish this study or whatever soon, right? And yeah, I, I think it's been. We don't know what they're doing. If they're doing it in a rolling fashion mm -hmm. or if they're doing it they do it all at once or like those things matter so mm -hmm. because we have no indication of what they're going to do i'm just we'll do a rolling because mm -hmm. it'll hurt so much but um we don't know what they're going to do so it's hard to plan for it yeah i would agree and i i think it's a lot like the the six semester average for tech tech tuition i can't imagine that they're going to say this is the new process and we recalculated it. So next year you lose a hundred kids. Um, I think it will be something that somehow gets averaged in over time. I, I mean, it will hurt it, even if it's just 10 kids. Mm -hmm. I mean, that, it, they may say, oh, we're only gonna, maybe there'll be a hold harmless provision where they say nobody's gonna drop more. In statute mm -hmm. right now, there's a hold harmless of three and a half percent. Nobody can drop by more than three and a half percent for equalized pupils. But even three and a half percent is a pretty big number and would have a pretty big tax implication. Um, I think, I don't think that we can plan for it necessarily, but I think during the year where it happens, there's going to have to be some serious thought about can we reduce some expenses to try to figure this out? Can we, you know, do we still have fund balance as a, as a lever to try to use? Um, you know, are there other revenues we can try to bring in to offset this? I mean, it may just be a, a kind of a new, um, kind of a new standard that we're going to have to set is, is, you know, because of this, we're going to have to figure out a way to reduce education spending by so much, uh, in order to come to this new level, this new equilibrium. And, and I hate using that term as winners and losers. I, Really, there's going to be people that gain and people that subtract in a number. It's probably, as a matter of fact, I know it's the right thing to do to recalculate this because there are communities that really should have um, more spending available to them. Um, it's just a bad way to, to say it. But I think our equalized people count is probably going to drop and others will go up. I appreciate that. Sentence. But not okay. this. I don't think it'll happen this year. I don't think we have to deal with it. I mean, could the plan would be somewhat analogous to what it had to do with Act 46 of so just knowing that we've got this kind of graduated, yeah, I mean, essentially increase. Um, the good thing about Act 46 is, you know, when we did this the first year, when we got that eight cent tax increase or tax rate reduction, we spent a lot of money on one time costs. Yeah. And that way we knew we could just take it out of the budget every year. Um, but that was, that was like, staying at this level, you know, in a way. And now this is going to be re having to really reduce. Um, so we can't like increase expenses that we can strip away. We're going to have to really decrease expenses or increase revenues right. and come up with a new normal as far as spending goes. Um, you know, hopefully it won't be as much of an impact as I think. And, and I hopefully it does get averaged in over time where it's not going to be 
a huge impact. I can't imagine that they wouldn't do that, though, because there would just be such outcry statewide because there are so many districts that would lose equalized pupils and it would drive a huge tax rate increase all over the place. So this year, I don't think we need to worry about it. And then next year, we'll see how much it has to be, but um, hopefully not dramatic. One more question, yeah. which might be for Libby, might be for Grant. But um, when you talk, when you, when you, the state with the external factors like dollar yield, CLA, I'm curious how you take those into account when you're in your deliberation phase, <laughs> when the leadership is all. We don't in the beginning. Okay. <laughs> we go into the room with the magic walls that you can write on yep. and we brainstorm the heck out of what we would love to do yeah. uh -huh. and love to see happen. And we don't pay any attention to that. And Grant sits and rubs his head a lot and um, gets all stressed out. And then from there, when the numbers start coming in, then we see how we need to prioritize. Mm -hmm. So yeah. we do eventually, but not in the beginning. Yeah, yeah. And, and the board, you know, a few years ago, and kind of, especially when we came out, kind of gave instructions to start the budget process that we're really thinking about what you need to meet the needs of the yeah. kids and to meet the needs of the district without kind of coming in already saying, okay, we can't spend more than this because then that automatically limits the thinking at the beginning stage, so. Thanks. And I'm gonna go ahead and jump to the last piece of this um, because it kind of ties in. And then, I mean, we can still open it up to questions, but typically what happens is I will give the board something to chew on as far as guidance that you're going to give back to us to follow. I mean, instead of you just having to come up with something from scratch. Um, and what you just asked is kind of part of this, because if, for example, CLA, I'm really concerned about CLA. So because of that, I chose a number of 3.5% as a, as a goal on here, as far as an increase in um, education spending. One, it's a goal. So every time I say something, Libby keeps reminding me, it's a goal, Grant, stop rubbing your face. So <laughs> it, it's a goal, but it also gives us something to kind of shoot for. Mm -hmm. And if, if the CLA was gonna, you know, if I thought CLA was gonna go up and tax rates were gonna go down, then I might say, well, you know, maybe you should ask us to try to limit it to 5%. Mm -hmm. But really what I'm trying to see is what do I think might happen to tax rates? Because I try to maintain some kind of stable tax rates. And so that's why I chose three and a half percent this year. I don't think it's really reasonable to think we come in any lower than that because most of our money is in salaries and benefits. We know what the salary increase is. We know health benefits are gonna go up 10% or health premiums. So it's very hard to come in any lower than that. Mm -hmm. um, but that's why I picked that number. Mm -hmm. But the guidance that, that I was proposing is that you could have us consider all the requirements that would improve student learning, obviously, because that's why we're here. Mm -hmm. Scrutinize staffing levels, since that's where most of the money is in the budget. Um, and then prioritize requirements at the end to try to get uh, a goal of about three and a half percent. I will tell you that if there's a lot of stuff on that list that we think we really have to have and we're at four and a half percent, then we're gonna come in with four and a half percent. But we try to like at least keep this as a sanity check in our head, like let's try. Um, so that was the, the guidance. Now you could say, yes, that's the guidance we want you to operate under, or you could give me completely different guidance, or you could not give us any and we'll just you know, do the best we can. Um, but at this point, I would say, if you wanna give guidance, you can give guidance. If you have other questions, I'll be glad to answer and I'll turn it back over to you. Okay. And and, again, and let's try to wrap up the next couple minutes because then we've got one more item and then um, we're running a little behind. But go ahead. I have a small question. Um, and I should know this, but can you tell me uh, what the uh, percentage increase was in the, uh, in, the, in the prior year? Oh, my goodness. I should know that too. <laughs> yeah, I really should. I, Last year? I yeah. don't know. Yeah, it's the percentage good. increase in education spending. Yeah. Um, I think it was actually under 3%. I, I, I want to say 2.8. I think it's 2.8. I think it was 2.8 or 2.6. Yeah, it was, it was under 3%. I know that. Um, I know that's not that relevant, but I just wanted to know what it was. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I'm also going to offer up Grant, but if you, um, he definitely can answer technical questions um, by email if you have them. 
looking at something, oh my God, what is the CLI? We don't bombard him, but um, he definitely is, he knows his stuff um, and, and the budget process is hard. I, I, Amanda? Yeah, so I see a timeline or in September. And so you said December, it, you guys will bring the budget back to the board. Yeah, January was, gets approved, and then in March gets voted mm -hmm. by the by the community. So um, I know that last year there was like a few of us that are new. I know there's a new person that's gonna come in. So I'm wondering if we can <clears throat> plan to have like a training on the CLE. I know that Chloe did one uh, in the state house. I think that was really good. Is that Andrew? Chloe was the person that you Chloe mentioned. Was, uh, yeah, she's the one who went to school office. Um, Montpelier resident. So I was thinking, like, if we could plan to have one of those trainings, just I, I think it's really important for us to kind of before the vote in December to be able to just like really understand all the things and then the just like that training that's like on the CLA and also like the education funding. So that is like gives us like three months before before our December vote to be able to be informed as to you know all the things I think that was recorded I could see if I could find that recording because I agree that would be really helpful. Yeah, I think Bonnie's really well. I think Jay's done some things too that mm -hmm. we could probably share. Sort of piggybacking on that I think it might be good to have like more of a general maybe it's just like a one hour meeting um, training of, for all of us on like, what is the board's role when it comes to the budget? And so Grant just said, you know, you could offer guidance tonight. I don't feel prepared or equipped to know what would be appropriate at this juncture in terms of guidance, you know, as an individual board member. So I think it would be cool to have a, like a one hour sit down with um, the more veteran board members and maybe Grant as well. <laughs> and Libby. Um, so, uh, just to get a better understanding of what the board's role is in this whole process. Yeah, no, it's definitely something we do. One thing I'll offer as a resource, the podcast episode that Grant and Libby did at the beginning of this year, it was like the first one, I think, um, was a really good primer mm -hmm. on some of this vocabulary and stuff. So I, I'm going to make a note to myself to, to re-listen to it and it'd be good for any community member who's who's feeling like dollar yields, CLA, you know, it went, it, that was very helpful for me to listen to. So new board members and community members and returning board members, um, that's a good resource too. So Greg, with that said, before the vote in, in March, um, I know that like you guys did that great podcast and it was awesome, but also like just for us to plan on translation and being able to like do the community sessions to ask questions. So if that happens in January, like, or like, does it happen? So January is the, is around the middle of January is whenever the board has to say yes to take, this is the budget we're gonna take to the voters. And the reason for the delay is because they, it has to go to the municipality so that they can get the warnings and their annual mm. reports, all that kind I of see. stuff. So once that's done, Really, there's a window from January until you know middle of January till the very beginning of March to do public outreach, and um, a lot of times, like uh, not so much last year because of COVID, but you know in the past we've served lunch at this at the senior center, and you know they've asked questions during a break, and we've talked. Um, there are, sometimes board members will go to in the Rotary Club or something like that. There's different outreach that we can do to explain the budget or, you know, just, um, I think we do. That, right, and that's, that's the window from the middle of January till town meeting day is really just the window to communicate and try to sell. Yeah. If you're trying to get input, then we should start now with ideas and priorities so that we can throw that in. Um, a lot of times that bubbles up though, because it's parents that talk to principals and then principals put it in their budget. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of times it happens organically, um, but this would be a good time to, you know, talk to community members, find out what's going on, what they're thinking is priorities. Um, 
this budget process, one of the wild cards is going to be all this federal funding um, because we have to kind of figure out um, in the facility size, especially, what are we going to keep in the normal general fund for facilities? What are we going to put in the capital fund for you know, projects versus what might we decide we would spend infrastructure money on if and when it comes or SR3 money or uh, fund balance money? Um, so there, that will be a, a little bit of a dynamic to figure out. Um, but yeah, right now, if, if you're talking to people and you're hearing what they're thinking is important and can bring that through, especially it works best if it goes through the schools, yeah. because then, you know, a principal can hear that and then mm -hmm. compare it to what they already are thinking about as far as mm -hmm. priorities and then bring it forward. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just stop talking. About yeah. That. yeah, no, definitely. Um, yeah, the, we usually get the first budget presentation at the first meeting in December. Um, yeah, and then there's time really to change it until we approve it. So between, particularly now in November is kind of the prime time to do outreach and, and get priorities to get the ideas. Um, and as far as like board members trying to refresh their memory, do you still have that, that slide? There's a slide that we do. Um, well, I'm, you can, I'm sure you can't see it, but it the tax rate calculation that starts with total budget minus revenue, non-tax revenues equals, all the symbols are there that walk you through the math of it. I mean, you'll, you'll still have to refresh your memory on, you know, CLA is on there, so what is CLA? I mean, yeah, I struggle with that every year, but um, at least that'll show you how the math works to build the tax rate. And that's half the battle is figuring out how the math works on it. Um, and, and seeing that, the answer to the question is education spending went up 2% last year. <laughs> 2.8 was the total budget. So last year was a pretty good year. So on, on your timeline for tonight's meeting, September 1st, mm -hmm. it says for the, uh, for the school board to discuss the process and priorities and guidelines. Those are your process your and Libby's process priorities and guidelines, right? That's not like, none of that is supposed to come from the board. Yeah, I think process is is me explaining what the budget process is that we follow. And some of the stuff we can't do anything about, like middle of January, we have to have an approved budget. Mm -hmm. um, priorities is, if, if there were anything that I knew of right now, I would have brought them up. I mean, I talked about some of the pressures and opportunities. As far as from your perspective, priorities was, if you already knew of any priorities, and if you did, great, you can bring them up now. If you didn't, this is my reminder to you that this is a good time to get input from people. If, if anybody out there is talking about priorities that, that want to come in, yeah. the earlier, the better into the process. Um, a lot of times, you know, we're doing a presentation in January and, and somebody comes in and starts advocating for something that we didn't hear about until then. And it's really late to try to throw mm -hmm. it in. Um, so for the community to know that we're looking for priorities now that they can push forward, for you to know that if people come to you, that's something to make sure that we're hearing about, whether it's through the school or directly to us. Um, so yeah, priorities, process. Um, and then the other piece was, well, the timeline that you got, and then guidance if you choose to give it. And if not, then we'll just kind of proceed like we normally do, um, which is basically throwing everything that we know of yeah. on the wall and then trying to figure out what we can afford. So, so would that be something we can talk about in the next board meeting? Like we're we're going to be guidance? talking about the budget yeah. pretty much That's every board meeting now okay. and the time we right. approve it. It's a, it's a big part of our job. We're going to have yeah, a lot of discussions and kind of continuing information and opportunity for us to, you know, give the priorities we're hearing from the community and for the you know, administration to respond and um, for us to, you know, again, give give suggestions, um, you know, give some priorities, et cetera. Um, the, Jim, sorry, yeah. over the course of the year already, we have heard several sort of asks from the community at these meetings not directly saying like, hey, when you're considering next year's budget, can you do this? But sort of like asking about like the track facilities, which I know we're thinking about for ESSER funding or whatever, the federal funds that are coming down from infrastructure. But um, we've also heard about like, uh, was it a heat pump at Roxbury? And I've, I've heard of several. And I'm just wondering if there's like a central place that we're sort of keeping all of that feedback that I could review just to 
see if there's anything that I feel is missed from these board meetings and the stuff that we've heard about. I'm not, I mean, the two that you mentioned, uh, I know about that we're trying to figure out. I mean, well, actually the heat pumps in Roxbury, I think are a designated use of fund balance that's on the quarterly report. Um, the track is a big one that we're trying to figure out. So which bucket makes the most sense. But as far as anything else that's come up, whether there's some kind of standing list, I don't, I don't do you yeah, know. The infrastructure presentation that we did in the last board meeting had a, had a vast majority of them in it. But some of the other like social emotional, like those other conversations around special ed, you know, like just how, how when it comes to prioritization later, if we have like that, that feedback in one central place, just to see, oh, you know, like, can you tell us a little bit more about like, these were some of the concerns that parents had, you know, like just, um, just something to think about that we can now. Uh, well, at a board level, am I wanna do that? Would I do that? Yeah. Yeah, I'd be happy to try I think, to try I to think having that. like one board member who like kind of keeps track of that makes sense. Yeah, because I, I lose track. Else. Just yeah. my memory isn't yeah. as good as it once was. Yeah, no, but I, 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 think, it's a, I think it's a good idea to <laughs> keep track of this because it's easy to kind of for ideas to come up and then say, oh, that's a good idea. And then we move on to the next okay. thing. So we yeah, would do like a few sessions where we just brainstorm about here's what we're hearing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And I'm, um, I do want to move on because we are over time. Uh, but thank you, Brad. I know we'll hear from you um, plenty. You'll be seeing plenty of me. Yeah. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, RFP for district visioning work. Is this you or I know Mia was working on it? Mia? We're just opening it up for any more feedback. Um, Amanda shared some over email with us. So I made adjustments based on Amanda's feedback. And so the one that Libby sent, the, the version that Libby sent out on Monday afternoon or Tuesday morning is the most recent one, yeah. one of those two. Um, uh, so it, this is really just the time for the board to take a look at it and say, you missed a period or <laughs> um, we actually don't think we need this or what, you know. I, I have a question once I open it up. I mm -hmm. remember I had a question when I read it before. I'm just looking for it. I also- And is that something we can share with the- Yeah. Go ahead. Um, and maybe you decided not to do this so that it would be more open-ended. But I was just wondering, um, well, I guess I have a couple of questions. One is, did, did you consider any specific deliverables that we might want out of this? Like there's high level, like, you know, we, we want um, a cohesive vision of what um, an exceptional education within MRPS looks like, but like, do we want to receive that via a report? Do we wanna like have some presentations? Do you see the bulleted list on the bottom of the first page? Let me go. Or written summary of findings, qualitative data points. On the bottom of the first page? Yeah. No, I don't Is see it. it. We, don't, we don't have the version that we have maybe? Yeah. Oh, I think you are still showing the old one, Libby. Maybe we have the old one, actually. We might have the old one. Yeah, I think we do have the old one. Shoot! Hold on. If we have the old one and there's a new one with that type of stuff. Okay. Yeah. It's under a duck. Send you a link again if you want. Where is it? I, I just did a search in the docs, um, oh. RFP, and that's the one that came up. Oh, it wasn't the one in our packet. No, I don't know. A, I just it was did the a second email. I, I did a search in on the Google Drive oh. itself. So right here, Andrew, you can see it up on the screen. All right. Yeah, that's good. So good idea. Yeah. Because <laughs> yes. Can you highlight the differences between the version that I've read and this version? Or are they like, are there too many? Is that um, not a good use this, of time? The bulleted list is a, is a highlight. There's some differences in the first two paragraphs. The flow of them is a little different, but they mostly say the same thing. 
Um, terms and conditions, there are no changes to projected schedule. There's no changes to, and then other big additions were Amanda had some great ideas for um, successful proposals. Um, there's um, yeah, examples of that. numbers seven through nine are so, new. So let me ask this question. Would it make sense if we're running behind schedule? Would it make sense? Because it sounds like you didn't read the, yeah. that version either. Yeah. No. Would it make more sense to bring this up next time, or do we like really need to move on this tonight? And then, which case we might want to take like ten minutes to review it, but we're a little behind schedule. So, um, I think rather than wait until the next board meeting, um, because as you can see, we would like to we'd like submissions back by October thirteenth, and so I want to give people time enough to prepare their proposals. Yeah. If you don't, if if you don't want to take the time now because we are running behind, I would say read and send edits. edits just straight to me, Jim, and Libby. And again, like we, we'll just look at any themes that come from everybody's feedback, and then we can just put it out there because um, it's not something we actually have to vote on, is my understanding. Right. It's just more like we're just right. getting. Input. Input. Yeah. The anyway. email theme from me and Keisha looking for it on August 30th. It's called updated RFPs with board meeting. Um, and is Kristen on? Yeah, Kristen. No way. She is. She just sent me a text. Yes. Like waves crashing on her face. Seriously. I don't see. Maybe she's muted. Oh, Maybe she's press star six. <laughs> she said I'm talking. <laughs> oh. All right. Maybe we need to like unmute her officially from our end. Do you want me to go to the computer and look at it? You can see if you can. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yeah. Very, yeah. Well, very ah, well. Miraculous. Okay. Uh, yes, I am on a boat uh, out at sea, and I'm I'm going to try to be succinct and brief. Uh, I had. One question is if, if there's a budget that's established and if that would be mentioned here so that um, a consultant might know how to frame their proposal. And then I was just curious if we had a budget. Um, and then, yeah. if, if you put a budget in it's an RFP. Best practice for RFP. It's what? Best practice for RFP. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's not that common of practice actually because what will happen is if you have bidders that might be willing to go below yes they're going to go up to that point yeah if i mean if, or, if you have lots of bidders you know they're bidding that could be one thing but if your number is low then i i would tend to agree with that the number of bidders you know are going to bid a lot more and if it's a competitive bidding it's a good practice to put a budget number so you're going to get lots of bids and they're going to compete but if your number of bidders is low then you're going to run into if you put a budget number, then it's going to be, you know, you're not going to get to, you're not starting off. With but numbers. so for the work that I'm doing with all the uh, organizations and consultants that are BIPOC, that are, um, that's like one of the requirements because if they can't, you know, pay their team, if this, pro, you know, like the VSBA, the 3B, they put in here's $40,000, $90,000. And we might pick five facilitators for this, you, you know, can, like so that's like some of the considerations can, when in equity work. Yeah, but you can, if you look at state contracts, for example, a lot of state contracts, there are requirements that certain wage, like certain wage requirements are met, certain labor conditions are met. You don't put your budget out there for an undertaking necessarily. So I heard. Kristen asked the question, I think, as a way of recommending that we do it. Amanda's recommending to do it. I saw Jim nodding. I'm just saying, like, maybe I, if, if the consensus of the board is that we should do it, maybe we do it. I, I would strong, I would vote against this. So I would like to put it through a vote. I think it's a bad idea. But I don't think it serves our taxpayers. That's that's my thought. Would we need to vote on a budget? Would we need to? Would that be something that we would need to vote on if we were to put it in there? We have we have, have, we have a line. We have a line item in the budget, budget. which is probably public information. Yeah, <laughs> that's one. That's another. Thing. Our advice. Well, if the board wants to do it. 
I don't feel strongly either way. I think no, I don't feel strongly either way. Either. I think I, I, I just don't think it yields good results. Yeah, I, I, I think it's I would a tend bad to agree practice. with Andy. I would, I would, I would tend to agree with Andy. But um, if it's public information, right, that, that, that information can be access, yeah, accessed, then um, then it may become an equity issue. Is like some people be able to access it just because some others don't know why are you hiding it. And so in effect, then you might as well put it because it is well, available. One thing. I guess on the equity front, if we wanted to ensure certain requirements for that, we could we could stipulate that in here if we really wanted to do that. I mean, you could just use a state contract as an example, because a lot of state contracts have like well, I, I can hear you. a lot of state contracts have um, certain wage requirements and labor requirements and environmental um, stewardship requirements and whatnot. So like when RFPs go out at the state level, if 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 we want to, when you're talking about equity, what do you mean, I guess? It's being able to access contracts like this. And so there's a whole conversation around what are the challenges for BIPOC consultants that are doing this work, that are doing really good work. And this is one of them. It's like that organ, like uh, institutions, um, are not transparent around funding. There's like this whole conversation. You can ask the Senate that, that that is part of the conversation that's happening on this day. It, it feels a little akin to me to the movement now to make sure that um, salary ranges are on job descriptions so that a candidate isn't guessing. So essentially, we're, we're not hiring a staff person, but we are hiring a consultant. What we'd like to do is take out some of the guesswork. And I just, I overlooked it in drafting the RFP. I think a salary range for a job is different than, than this. Yeah, it's not the exact same, exactly, but, it, but it feels like in the same spirit. Yeah. Okay. We do still have Kristen on the line. Yeah. Did you have any other questions or feedback, Kristen? Hi, I do. Sorry. So yeah, and mine wasn't necessarily a recommendation. It was a, a kind of a wonder and a curiosity. Is that that's okay. something that's standard? So I'm, I'm hearing the dialogue and it's a little bit um, broken up for me, but I'll have to come back and listen to the meeting. Um, and then my second uh, thought was just kind of acknowledging that we're still in a, in a very uh, fluid and dynamic public health situation with COVID and just if it made sense to, you know, in a couple sections, maybe um, the, you know, successful proposals piece that if, if you know, someone wanted to speak to you know a variety of strategies that might respond to the dynamic situation that we're still in and then if it also made sense to include anything like in the terms and conditions not knowing kind of how the next you know handful of months that are within the work schedule time frame are going to pan out and just um if we want to name anything specific i mean ideally i, I know that this um process is happening you know a year later than or, or we had two years later than than hoped and that it's timely and that it's needed um but if we wanted to build anything in that just would allow for some flexibility um uh, because I, I know that we want to optimize this process and that there could potentially be curveballs in the ways in which that we're able to engage with the community so i was just thinking a little bit about that and that's just, uh fodder for us to consider The C, Cooper. Good. <laughs> the PA, the announcements over the PA system took her. I, I think I gathered there were two things she was thinking that we'd like to see the people who are proposing include strategies for how they'll keep, how they'll do engagement in the time of COVID safely. And then the second one I got a, was a little bit lost to me that she was recommending. Yeah, well, this is very so the, fluid, the fluid around COVID. Yeah. Like, were they the same thing? No. Okay. Well, we can send her an email and make sure she has yes. input. Yeah. Um, so we'll just set a deadline by this Friday to have final yeah, thoughts. Yeah. Um, I'm just with this yeah, whole email. question about like adding the salary, the uh, budget for it. Um, I just quickly opened up the policy, our policy on budget ex execution EO2. And there's an RFP section. And I'm just wondering, I'm guessing you already looked at all that and made sure that we were in compliance of our own policy. 
that, just know that that RFP is that part of the policy is a lot to the contractors. Yep. There's just a okay. So request for proposals, contract only, basically. It, yeah, that's pretty much what it's talking to. Okay. Great. So, Nia at all by Friday. Yep. Um, and then we can get this out and get this process moving, which is exciting. Um, Libby, you're. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay, so this presentation was supposed to be SBAC scores. However, last week, late last week, we got an email that says SBAC scores are still embargoed. So we can't share SBAC scores. Um, we're not sure what's going on there. So um, most of this presentation is the exact same presentation that I gave to the um, entire faculty for in-service. Okay, so um, changed a little bit for you all, but, but the slides are generally the same. Um, so uh, this was all the same information. So I'll start with, um, this is a piece that we're working on with our faculty around it's not there yet. The board has a vision statement that's on our letterhead. Um, and when that vision statement was made, it was um, discussed that the mission of the district, it's charged to us. Um, and so this is what the leadership team is playing with. It's our moral imperative to ensure that any child who graduates from MRPS has a limitless future. And it's our responsibility to build systems where student success is not determined by luck, willpower, family dynamics, or any other mitigating factor that's out of our control. Um, so we're still mulling over how to make that sound a little better and less wordy, um, but the whole, the idea is any kid who graduates from us has any choice out there and they have the skills and the confidence to go out and get it. Um, that's the main gist of, of what we're thinking about right now. Um, I also shared with them over the summer, uh, speaking with different MRPS parents, this was the, this was the sentiment that I heard from, from at least five of them this summer. It's almost like you're waiting for my kid to fail. Um, and, and that's an accurate statement from those five parents and their perception. Um, so we, I shared that with them, uh, with our staff and talked about, so this right here is the reason why we've been working on the systems we're working on, right? So when I, this is now my fourth year as superintendent, our, my, our first year really focused on culture. Did we truly believe that all students will learn at high levels because of what we do every single day with them? Not what you all do at home with them, but what we do with them. Um, so we worked on that quite a bit around what's a healthy culture and what's a toxic culture my first year. I did a lot of listening. I did a lot of watching, a, little, a lot of data analysis. And at, at about mid-year through that first year, I, we came up as a leadership team with the four pillars, which veteran, more veteran board members have seen as the red Venn diagram. So that red Venn diagram has kind of morphed a little bit into something a little, slightly snazzier because I now have Anna. <laughs> um, so this is it. It's the MRPS theory of growth with this idea that we want limitless futures. Jim has given the feedback already to make this less wordy. Um, so I'm gonna maybe call on you all to help me because it's this is like my world and I walk out on this. So it's hard to make it less wordy for me. Um, so if you have some ideas. The four big ideas that we're gonna go into, the idea of collective responsibility and collaborative practices, is formalized essential learning, timely system to enrich, intervene and remediate, a high quality instruction in every single classroom. You've seen this before, you've just seen it in a different form in the red diagram as board members, because this is certainly not new. It's been around for, I'd say we named it about two years ago as like a public document, maybe three years. I don't know, with COVID, I keep losing track of where we, <laughs> where we are. Um, so the idea is just quickly collective responsibility and collaborative practices that what we do with children every day is incredibly complicated and no one person could possibly have all the knowledge they need to make it happen for kids. Um, this is not an assembly line. And so in order to have that limitless future, in order to create that reality for kids, then we have to do it together and build on each other's unique strengths as educators. Formalized essential learning is the idea that we cannot possibly teach everything, that the common core alone, if we were to teach every single common core standard and assure, ensure that um, students master every single one of the common core state standards in reading, writing, math, and, li and listening, 
that they would need at least 22 years of schooling with us. We do not have that time. That's based on Marzano's research. He writes a book every other month. He's a big educational researcher. We don't have that kind of time. And so we need to prioritize what it is that we truly are saying every child will be proficient in by the end of their greater content. Um, there, are, so we're thinking about what's nice to know and what's essential to know um, in order to be successful when they move on, in order to build content knowledge that's imperative, um, that kind of thing. We're also thinking about timely system to enrich, intervene, and remediate. So every learner is unique. No two learners are the same. And some kids need more time with ideas. Um, and so the traditional schooling method is that um, learning is the, is the thing that's a variable and time is not. If I'm done teaching this, I'm moving on. We wanna flip that around so that learning is no longer the variable. Learning of the essential skills, the essential learning that we're naming in that formalized fashion is the thing that we will enrich in, will intervene in, and will remediate in if necessary. Um, and I'll go into that a little bit later. High quality instruction in every classroom is that as a profession, there are certain practices that we know get good outcomes for kids. And there are certain strategies that we know don't. And so as a staff, we need to come together and name what does that mean and that every single learner will have a teacher in front of them that knows what high quality instruction looks like for MRPS. So it takes the luck out of things. So Emma's kid, if he's, she's in a, if Petra's in a different class than Mia's kid, they're still gonna have same high quality instruction around the same formalized essential learning, that it's not different. Um, so that's high quality instruction. Every classroom, we'll go into that a little bit. So these slides are evident of what is the work this year, okay? So formalized essential learning for this school year, because this isn't the first time we're working on this, right? But for this school year, we've now named curriculum teams. Curriculum teams are a pretty common practice across districts. MRPS never had them before. So they're district-wide teams with a range of teachers from kindergarten to 12th grade on it. Those curriculum teams are naming the priority standards. So when we go into the common core, we're looking at which ones are the, or, or next gen or whatever, whatever standards document that content area is, which one of these are our priorities? Which one gives us longevity? Which one gives us staying power? Which ones are the ones that other, other standards build upon and kids have to know them? The curriculum teams will name those. They'll develop a proficiency scale for each of those priority standards. So right now, when you get a report card from different students, we don't use that as a data point for our district because two first grade teachers might have different prior, might have different proficiency scales. They might be using different proficiency scales because we haven't formalized them. And when I say formalized, I mean written them down. So you can access them as a parent. When we have this priority standard on a report card, you'll know here's the proficiency scale. So that too is not a thing that you're like, what's that mean? Right? It's going to be spelled out and named, which we do not have right now. And uh, it's a big missing piece for a place that's um, celebrated for proficiency-based learning. That's missing from us right now. We'll be, that team will be providing an index of assessment items that match the rigor of the proficiency scale. So when we say a student is a three and a priority standard, then we have assessment items that match what that rigor, what that three means. So kids are assessed, not at what a teacher is guessing that proficiency means, but what we've named that proficiency to be. Um, and forgive me, because I know there's a lot of educational jargon in here. So if I really say something that's really jargony, just call me out on it. Um, and then they'll also, this team will also communicate back to the teammates, get feedback on what they're doing, bring that back to the curriculum team and revise and work. So it's not one team making all the decisions that all the teachers are involved. At the school level, we're participating um, the admin is participating in each in different teams. We're giving time and the admin, we were working really hard on knowing the why and the what. So we're all talking about the same thing. When we say that we all, when we say priority standard, all of the administrators mean the same thing. Um, and then at the district level, we're providing resources, a whole lot of time. Mike Berry's done a heck of a job organizing the learning that needs to come. If there's professional learning for these curriculum teams, they need. 
the money we're paying teacher stipends to do the work because it's after school hours. We're providing direction, we're monitoring them, and we're going to publicize them. So I'm starting to work on my own superintendent's newsletter or blog, and that um, blog will be split into these four areas. So the idea is each time I write it, that it will be celebrating work within these four areas so to make them more public for the, for the community. When we're thinking about collective responsibility and collaborative practices, <laughs> I was trying to get to the teachers that just because we're saying that does not mean that we are all lockstep, right? <laughs> and that we're all doing the same thing, that when we're really talking about what high quality performance is, it's when it's, the performance is impactful and it's increasing. And I've asked the teachers to look at these two statements and think which one of these statements are you really grabbing to right now? The research is incredibly clear by John Hattie, who has done meta-analysis, which a meta-analysis is looking at thousands upon thousands of studies to see what the effect size on learning is or on different practices. Schools that are here, who, where teachers collectively say this statement, have a much higher collective impact on learning than teachers who say, I know I can reach my kids, right? It's our kids. We all have responsibility for these kids. So we are really working on this piece right now. It's called collective efficacy. I'm sure you've all heard that term. So John Hattie's research says that it has a 1.5 effect size on student learning. So when you think about what that means, his research on these meta-analyses is that a 0.4 effect size roughly translate into one year of learning. It's a typical year of learning. A kid comes in the beginning of second grade, they learn one year of second grade work and they're ready for third grade. Does that make sense? So if a school is displaying collective efficacy, we can move all kids together, then those schools are showing a 1.57 effect size, which is two and a half years of learning in one year. Yeah, so it's big. It's so that collaborative practices piece is enormous for us. Um, it's, the, it's actually the number one influence on, on student learning. And it, I wanna make it really clear with teachers that it's not sitting around and collaborating around where the next field trip is, the nice to know conversations. It's looking collaboratively about evidence and taking collective action on what the evidence is saying to us. So I, one of my main things I say to teachers all the time when I'm doing data days with them is that data is not condemnation, it's information. It's information for us to act on or not. We get to make those decisions, um, but a, collect, a school that has strong collective efficacy takes that data, takes that evidence, and decides to take action collaboratively on it. Do you have a question? Can you give an example about what, what a piece of evidence might look like and 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 a kind of collective action yeah, someone might take. Yeah, so, take. Two, so a year ago, every, I have three what's called data days a year with guiding coalitions, which is the teacher leadership team in each building, um, in each of the buildings. And three years, two years ago, virtually, the UES first grade team showed data that their first graders came into the year with not knowing all their letter sounds right? That is a skill first graders should know when they come in. They shared that data openly in a very respectful way as because they were talking about how they were going to collectively move them off the dime, right? The kindergarten teachers heard that information because they're, you know, they were in that too, in that data day team meeting. And they made a collective goal that that would never happen again. And so this year, you know, so then when we had the next day to day, they were specific to show evidence that they had targeted that. They knew exactly which kids didn't have their letter sounds at that point, and they moved, you know, they, the plan for moving them forward. Mm -hmm. That's the kind of thing we're talking about, right? They heard the information. They didn't say, oh, woe is me or those kids or whatever. They said, that's on us. We're going to talk about that and we're going to move on it. And last year was the very first year that we, I think there was in a board presentation that we had all first graders knowing every single one of their letter sounds, right? Mm -hmm. And that's, that's the difference right there. Yeah, Thanks. Um, that's a good example, thanks. Yeah. Um, so what's happening this year with that? Remember, this is the work for this school year. Um, in the we, it's in the professional learning communities. You'll often hear me refer to that as PLCs. So in their PLCs, they're answering these four questions. Every single, every single time they are focusing in on one of these four questions. 
What is it we want all kids to know? So what's the pri professional learning community? So it's the grade one team talking about their next unit of study in math or their current unit of study in math. So that team will be talking about what is it that we want all kids to know in this unit? Those are the priority standards. Let's make sure we're all clear on that and we're all clear on what proficiency means. How do we know they will know it? So what's the common formative assessment we're all giving so that Jill's not giving a different assessment that could be easier than Mia's, right? That they're giving the same assessment on the priority standards. How do we know if they don't get it? So they're all analyzing the data together, right? Um, and what do we do if they don't, what do they do if they don't know it? So if Susan Koch's kids are knocking it out of the park and Linda Dossie's kids scored lower, Linda can say to Susan, what did you do to do that? So I can do it myself or let's switch our kids all up because Susan really did a great job there. So she's going to take the kids who are still struggling with this and Linda's going to take these kids and, you know, so they're splitting it up. It's collective. And then what do we do if they already know it? right? It's the, it's the bane of my existence when kindergarten teachers are doing the letter of the day, not to say ours do, when my kid already knew all their letters. Why are they sitting there talking about what an A looks like when they already know what an A looks like, right? So, um, and excuse all my primary examples, I was a primary teacher, so it's just easier for me to say primary examples than others. At the school level, we're ensuring that the PLC time is built into the schedule. It is not extra for teachers. Um, that the principals are getting better at monitoring and coaching the PLC. So naming where they are in the PLC development, because our groups are all, our PLCs are all over the place, just like kids. And so they're naming where they are and then coaching them to move to the next level and celebrate the learning that's, that we don't do enough. When adults do really impactful behaviors on student learnings, we don't make that public enough and we need to do that better. We need to celebrate it. And at the district, again, we wanna ensure resources are available. We wanna message that again through different, different means. Um, we wanna assist in continuing to create the common language and we're coaching our administrators on how to coach their PLCs <laughs> going forward. This is the biggie for us this year. Both the priority standard work and the PLCs we've been working on. In fact, we focused in on those particularly last year because we didn't have the time we normally did. So it was easier to prioritize, right? We said, you, can, you don't have time to teach the nice to know. You only have time to teach the priorities last year. So we did actually a lot of work there last year across our district and they knew they had to work together in order to get it done. So. We, we actually have a lot of really good momentum in those two areas from our last year and a half of what we've been through. This is the place that we know we need to move strongly in and quickly in. Um, it's a place where when I started, we knew that we needed to move there. However, you have to have priority standards in place and you have to have a collaborative mindset before this means anything. So there is, there is now people may argue with me about this, but. I can't hire tons of billions of interventionists if we don't know what we're supposed to be teaching, right? It doesn't matter. And so, um, so we needed to get those two pieces really moving forward before we focused on this. We have a good step up on those first two pieces now. So now it's time to say, we gotta change this. It's not working because we have people saying, it's like you're waiting for my kid to fail, right? So we, this is our, the area for the next year or two we're really laser-like focused in. Um, can I ask you, yep. um, how did the priority standards get this, like, what was the process to decide, like, we're gonna focus on this five or? Yeah, there's a great book called Standard, uh, I can't remember the title right now, <laughs> but um, there's a process that the teachers will go through. So, and there's like, kind of like a, a question and answer. Does it have longevity? Will it support next year's content? Um, doesn't matter in life, you know? So I'll give you an example. In the English language common core standards for, I believe it's like ninth grade, I wanna say, maybe a little less, seventh grade. There's, um, there's a, a reading common core standard around naming theme and being able to provide evidence from a text to get theme. Now the idea of theme is critical for critical thinking, for problem solving, for everything, right? So that's a priority. There's also a standard that said, compare movie and drama of the same story. That's nice to know, right? Like, that's not really, that's, you know, like that's not a priority. A kid 
kid doesn't necessarily need to do that in order to think critically. They could do it as an activity, right? Does that make sense? So teachers are going through those, those standards and saying, which ones are the ones we're ensuring? And then they ask themselves the question, okay, we have this list of the standards. Do we have time to do all of these? Is it possible to get every, we're saying every single kid will get, will be proficient in those. Is that a possibility, right? Or we're gonna work our tushes off to get there. Mm -hmm. um, so, so then they have to ask those questions. That's, it's a whole process that they're looking at there, but it's based on the work of Tammy Keppelbauer. If you wanna write down that name. It's something like standardized, it's like standardized grading for school leaders, but I can, if you want to borrow it, I have it on a bookshelf. Yeah, I'd love right. to do it. <laughs> and so the, is it the teachers who have the final say on that, or do they have to get the approval of the principal? Oh, no, it's the, teacher. to... it's the teacher's work. It's not our work. It's yep. the teacher's work. Got it. We're guiding the process, mm -hmm. but, but they're, it's their work. Right. They have to own it. Um, okay, so this is a piece when we're thinking about I'm going to throw out some acronyms, RTI or MTSS. So RTI is response to intervention, which is, was, came out in the 80s, right? MTSS is Vermont, doesn't matter, it's synonymous, is multi-tiered system of support. The two things mean the same thing, okay? Um, and so when we're thinking about MTSS, what we do, they're re we're really talking about timely system to enter, en enrich, intervene, and remediate. I argue as a leader that MTSS encompasses all of these four things, all of these four areas of growth, okay? But really when we're getting nitty gritty about it, we're talking about this. One of the things that schools in general, and I'm talking about the Royal schools, not MRPS in general, or specifically, did with RTI is that they never defined things clearly. They hired interventionists without any goal for what they were gonna do. And kids, kids who didn't get it the first time, the loudest teacher would say, take them from me, they don't get it. And then they'd go to a separate room and, and it doesn't work. It's not effective, okay? This is what started in the 80s. In the 80s. MRPS is not alone in the structure, the ineffective structures that are occurring now and they are ineffective. <laughs> we do not have evidence that they are working, right? So, um, so the first thing we need to do is define what it means and how do we use our limited human resources, right? So when we're talking about universal first instruction, this is what is happening in, a, in the classroom. This is what happens, what you would say is teaching, right? So when we're talking about universal first instruction, it's on the priority standards for our academic and social emotional behavior um, for the grade level or content area, if we're talking about high school and middle school, that the PLC team, so the professional learning communities, determine what the shared formative and summative assessments. So formative is kind of like the doctor's checkup and the summative is like an autopsy, okay? So, so that when you're, when you're alive and kicking, you're going to the checkups to make sure you're, that's what formative assessment is. Summative means the unit has been taught and, oh, right? The unit has been taught and, and you're not really moving on that anymore with a whole class. Um, on the priority standards, and the PLCs are also conducting data analysis. It's all the work of what the PLC was in those four questions. The instruction needs to be the first instruction, like instruction kids are getting in the classroom with, with who you would name as your kid's teacher, right? It's differentiated, it's based on a growth mindset, it's intentional. So when I walk in, I say, what are you working on? They should be able to name it for me, the kids and the teacher. It's goal oriented and it's engaging to the students. Okay, that's what we're going for with that. And that 100% of our student population fall into this category. Every student has access to first universal first instruction, okay? When we're talking about tier two, this is where it starts getting fuzzy for people. Tier two and tier three, if I were to ask most teachers across the US to, to differentiate the two, they wouldn't be able to do it, okay? So tier two is what we're talking about, prevention or intervention. It's still on the priority standards. So we want the person or the people who are most expert in the priority standards of that grade level to provide the prevention or intervention. And who that who is that? It's your grade level teachers, right? It's your kid's teacher. So it's still in that classroom. It's just good teaching. You do a formative assessment, you get your data, you reteach to the kids who need it, you enrich to the kids who don't, you know, like, and you're going through this cycle. 
Um, but it could include pre-teaching, it could include reteaching, it could include just more time, it could include some, include some enrichment, but it's fluid and active within the classroom and it's based on the work of the PLC. Okay, so some examples might be at the high school level, they might be pre-teaching vocabulary. Oh crap, <laughs> yeah it is. Yeah. Yeah. So. We don't have an extension cord. So I'll just stand up. Do you have a map? Is that a map? No. Oh, yeah. oh, that's that one. Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I don't have a cord for that. So. No, it's not. That cord is in my room. Um, are you about ready to? I have that. You that's for it? you, isn't it? Mia has a map. Wait, is it open? I'll, I'll walk over and get it. It's in my it's in my office. Is that a No, no. But none of us have that. I'm impressed. It's in my office. You see it on the floor. Okay, so uh, let's see here. Some other examples are are regrouping the kids, right? Around for for different, you know, Susan takes some, Linda takes some, that kind of idea. Um, so that's prevention or intervention. That's just a reminder of what the priority standard is, right? So we're not giving prevention or intervention on everything. We're giving it on the priorities, right? So there still is some nice to know things, right? Like that compare a movie and a drama. That we're not giving intervention on that though, if somebody if somebody doesn't get that. We would give intervention on a kid who's not understanding the theme. Make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, and then we have tier three, which is intensive remediation. It is not special education. It's intensive remediation. And it means that there's, we're looking at multiple data points that, need, that a kid needs in a universal skill. So I'll give you an example of what a universal skill is. I was a second grade teacher, right? So decoding multisyllabic words in second grade is a second grade standard. That's what we want second graders to be working on. Decoding what? Uh, multi-syllabic words, like multi-syllabic, <laughs> right? Um, however, uh, letter ID is not like not a second grade standard, right? Letter sounds are not a second grade standard. If a kid comes in without those two things, that's a universal skill they need in order to be successful in second grade standards, right? So they would need intensive remediation in that. The person who's gonna give that intensive remediation is the person with the greatest expertise in that skill. So it's not an instructional assistant. It's, you know, it's a person who has skill in that area. This is where our interventionists come in, right? Um, and so eventually we've bought, we've, we're, we're working with a group called VCAT, which is a local Vermont uh, group for an instructional plan in there that the parent's going to be a part of building and that the parent knows about. I was a parent where my kid was receiving some remediation. I didn't know about it until parent conferences when the teacher said, would you like to meet with me? And I said, who are you, right? This is the place where we don't, we're not good at it. This is the place we need significant work on. Absolutely, 100% without a doubt. And we have this, so this year we're having intervention team to really name what those universal skills are by grade level. So they're not teaching anything, but we're really naming what they're teaching that we know how to write a really targeted focus goal. So the goals aren't the child will increase their comprehension. Comprehension is enormous. There are tons of different ways you could increase a child's comprehension. So we're gonna name what it is that we're gonna actually work on. We have a lot of work to do here. It is not gonna happen overnight. It's not gonna happen probably in a year. But this is the place where I, when I hear parents say, it's like you're waiting for my kid to fail, they have not been a part of this because we haven't been doing it well. That's what's happening there. And so when I hear that, I'm like, I thank you for telling me your story. In my head, it's thank you for telling me your story. Your story is, is helping me say, yes, this is what we need to work on, right? Because our, our schools weren't there yet. They, they weren't understanding what we needed to do yet. They're there now. That, that statement that I put up on the slide of it's like you're waiting for my kids to fail, that hit home for our teachers. They care, right? And so I had so many come up to me and say, let's get to work on that, right? So um, there's some examples of that, but really it's a plan. It's intensive. It's a three-week period of time. 
the kids mixing up their short E and short I found, that is not 30 minutes a day, five days a week. That's not what it means. You don't need that. You need 10 minutes for three days straight of jumping on lily pads that have short E, short I. You know, like you need really intensive focused work. And we're not good enough at that yet. Um, so this is the place where we're really focusing in on building our understanding for what this means. And then high quality teaching in every classroom. This is big for our teachers. I, this is a quote that I really hold on to because we have some veteran teachers who are good teachers, right? But to suggest that the quality teaching could be improved is not to say that teaching is of poor quality. Our, our job as teachers is really complex and we can always get better. So you don't have to be bad to get better. Um, and then this year, our teachers are working with uh, Christian Cordemanch, who he worked, they've been working with him for a while around math menu at the, uh, at the K-6 level. So it's differentiated math instruction. Uh, teachers development group, that's what TGG stands for. Sorry, I didn't put these out there. This was just the slide for the teachers. That's for our 712 teachers in math around math practices and math behaviors. Um, teachers College Reading and Writing Project will be focusing in on writing for our K-8 teachers. Um, PLL is a Vermont firm who's working with the high school around disciplinary literacy. Um, and then Core Collaborative is working with some belonging and inclusion work with us. And um, they're going to be making plans with colleagues to not just practice the work, but deliberately practice this work. I'm really focusing on this one idea that I'm going to practice as a teacher to get better at. Did you say discipline literacy? Disciplinary literacy. Discipl so what is, what is disciplinary so literacy? So it's the idea that literacy is not um, something on the plate, it is the plate. So it's like so, science disciplinary. How do you read like a scientist? How do you read like a mathematician? How do you read like a social scientist? That all of those domains, if you're not literate in the domain, meaning how do you read that work, uh -huh. then you're not successful there. Uh -huh. I'm glad you asked. I thought it was like behavior. Yeah, that, that's oh, sorry. <laughs> no, the discipline no, of discipline, science. Science. Yeah. The discipline too. of English. Got yeah. It. And then we have a lot of work to do in the background. So sometimes I say what's on the stage and what's behind the stage. And what's behind the stage is as, our, as a leadership team, we're really working on how do we build a common understanding of what we mean when we say best practice, right? What do we need? What are we looking for? And how do we give non-judgmental feedback so teachers are truly thinking about the choices they make in their classroom and their instruction? We're doing a lot of that work behind the scenes as a leadership team. And then thinking about how do we develop that strategy with our teachers to develop the teacher leadership and to build an understanding of an instructional framework, which we're using with the University of Washington called the 5D instruction, so five dimensions of teaching. Um, it's a great framework that uh, if you want to see it, I'm happy to share the PDF around that with you. Uh, so that's, that's this, when I'm talking about theory of growth, I know a lot of, a lot of, I, you know, we've had questions around what is the work? These are, this is what we're focused in on, these four areas. And I call it a theory, not a strategic plan, because it's evolving. And each of our buildings are in very different spots in these areas in that it's our, my job to say, you are clearly working in one or two of these four areas, because that's about all we can handle. <laughs> um, name which one it is based on where your school is and then we'll support you from the administrative level, but it's not, we're all locked up working on the same thing because not everybody's in the same spot. Um, so I know Emma asked for the continuous improvement plans today. I just shared it with you in your email um, and I can share it with, it's a dense document because it went to the AOE and has lots of links and all that kind of stuff, but I'm happy to share it. But in the continuous improvement plans, this is what it is. At, at the highest level, this is what it is. And questions. Is that something that you share publicly? Like that? It's on our website now. It is yeah. on the website. Because I thought it was, and it wasn't. Okay. I was today, like, where is this? When you asked today, I thought it was on our website. And, and okay. I was like trying to find it quickly, and I couldn't. So we got it up next time. So this is a, like a how many year plan do you envision like to get there? Or you're like, we know exactly what we need to do. like. Well, I know, I know our steps that we need to take. Yeah, there are definite like definitive steps that need to happen. Um, however, I couldn't say we're going to be top notch in this many years mm -hmm. because it's so evolving and we have such different schools in different places that one school could be nailing an idea. Like UES right now is really good on PL, is really good on that collaborative practices and collective responsibility. They're awesome at it, mm -hmm. right? but they don't have the, our, the MTSS piece. Mm -hmm. So um, that's gonna take multiple years for them to get to, mm -hmm. right? 
Um, so we're, you know, naming the priority standards. MHS has, like their math team is really fantastic at naming the priority standards and they're developing the proficiency skills, but others, other content areas aren't there yet, right? So they're so, it's hard to name exactly how long. And that's the beauty of a theory is that we should constantly be evolving um, and constantly be thinking, okay, we're here, so how do we get here? I will say I met with Mike Berry like a few years ago on some curriculum at the middle school. And so I know that people you've been already were at it for years mm -hmm. and there's some great work being done and real palpable improvements being made um, that impact the students and, and their learning. So it's been great. I mean, also I'll just speak from my experience that I think every school in Vermont, you know, proficiency-based learning was a huge paradigm shift yeah. and it's going to take time to get it right. And like the quote on the slide said, you know, you can still be doing a good job, but there's always going to be improvement. And um, I think, you know, the schools that I've taught at are along this same track of identifying priority standards and all of that. So I, I, for, so for the parents that have come forward sharing about like their kids current current like i'm just like thinking the kids now plus the kids in five years it's gonna be very different because you have evolved the system so what are the mitigation strategies for the kids now yeah like yeah, yeah. so things that we're working on right now that um we don't have right so one parent i know you've heard said you don't have any special educators or interventionists who know multi-sensory teaching accurate yep so this year we're getting you know so with that arp ida money we're pairing up with a CERN center and we're getting our, our teachers trained in multi-sensory teaching right so that's going to have an immediate impact on how kid how instruction is handled in the classroom um we also have just the idea of an intervention team that we're clearly defining what they do. So it's not, you're not teaching everything, mm -hmm. right? You're gonna have data in front of you that shows which kids you need to target and how you write those goals. That's gonna have an immediate impact, right? Um, so when I was a curriculum director in Swanton, for instance, they really focused in on timely intervention. And within a year, they had completely changed their system and they had absolute success and they had evidence of that success it was amazing what mm -hmm. they did um but they were laser-like focused in that now we're still in a global pandemic yep. so will we be laser-like focused yeah. like that right now i'm going to say probably not um, i'd like to be but there are other stressors hitting our system too so we just have to recognize that i mean I, this was really so helpful at, to to see the the big picture and the granular way that you're that you are um it, it's it's to me feels like a big mind mindset shift that you're working toward and practical yeah. application of it and so i just uh, appreciate you sharing this with us and um the uh i just had a couple of like little follow-up questions really the um the curriculum teams are they so like if it's the curriculum team for the first grade is it are those only first grade teachers on the no, curriculum so team the or curriculum is it teams are district wide so oh okay we ask teachers to um apply for the team mm -hmm. so we have grade level representation um all the way up mm -hmm. and uh so it's like it might be one first grade teacher mm -hmm. and they'll make some so it's vertically aligned mm -hmm. right because one of the things that we notice right away with some things we did have done on paper, which was not a lot when we took over. That's why you see formalized. When I when you see the word formalized, it means it's on paper. Got to write it down. Access it, mm -hmm. Right. So um, what we found was that either grade levels were repeating the same idea, even though it wasn't their standard, or they were just picking standards, whatever they felt like teaching. Or you know, so um, so that first grade representative will go back to their first grade team and they'll say, this is what we did as a K-1-2 vertical align piece. Mm -hmm. What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. And then bring it back. Mm -hmm. And then, so it's an iterative, iterative process. And it's usually by subject, by content. Yeah, area. so we have, yeah. A, we have a literacy, we have a math, we have yeah. science. We have so that makes, yeah. that, that makes a lot of sense. And the PLC, those are those, like those the first are graders are just first grade teachers. Generally, yeah. yeah. 
it gets it gets a little wonky at the high school. Mm -hmm. DLCs are tough when you have a small high school because yeah. you only have uh, you might have two teachers teaching algebra one, and they may not be teaching on the same at the same time. Meaning, wait, say not, that again. They'll teach both teach algebra one. So we may have two math teachers at the high school who both teach algebra one. Right. However, one may teach it semester one, and one may teach it semester two. Got it. So they're not doing the work at the same time, which makes it a little more tricky. So the PLCs at the high school may not be by content or class. It may be by it may be by a math team or an yep. algebra team uh -huh. or whatever that is. Okay. You know? um, so just it gets wonky and a little bit more tricky. And you also have singleton. You only have one Joe in Latin, right? Right. right. <laughs> He so is know. the PLC right. for right. Latin. Well, now we have extra point two, but but you know what I mean. Right? Yeah. Okay. So it gets a little wonky when you're in a small high school. Mm -hmm. Are there ways, though, like, I realize it's not a modern language Latin. Is there, are there, is there like a language group that can yeah. come together for something Yeah, like so it, in middle school, it's our, it's our languages, right? So the first, so Biba and our new Spanish teacher are one. And so they look at what are the commonalities that they both want to happen, whether it's like oral expression or whatever. And so Bibba will think about it in terms of French generally. And the new teacher will think about it in terms of Spanish. It gets trickier. It's hard to do it that way. But yeah. Thank you for sharing it with us. It's exciting to see. Yeah, this is amazing. Um, do you think there is a way to like then when there's budget process to like take this and be like, this is how. Yeah, so like the last like budget. Um, I don't see a board member yet, but the very first board meeting we had uh, that December 1st or whatever budget presentation, what we did was we took each of these, what we call them pillars then, each of these pillars and we said, here are the budget priorities that are aligned with these. Okay. So yeah, we aligned it that way. We'll probably do the same thing for board like that. Yeah, that's great. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. No, thank you, Louisa. Please come down to the yeah, it's really nice to see you in natural habitat. It's, like, yeah. it's, it's a beautiful needed. thing. I can nerd out on this for a while. Yeah. <laughs> that is clear. <laughs> um, excellent. So we are uh, rounding out the agenda to policy monitoring reports uh, to approve. Um, G1 or GO4, Title One comparability, and GO5, animal dissection. Uh, do I have a motion to approve the policy monitoring report for G04 Title I comparability? I have some questions that just happened after motion. I needed two minutes because I didn't see it in the thing. Oh. I did not rename it as policy monitoring. It also had share permissions issues. You were the only one that happened to you, though. Really? Me too. Oh, me too. And Amanda. Yeah, I, I couldn't. And Jim at the policy meeting. meeting oh, okay. yeah, I didn't, I didn't. On this one, should we just push this to next time because we're running late? We did. Yeah, yeah. that's my fault. I told you I'd make mistakes. <laughs> that's why I like Yeah, that. that's a fine one to make. Yeah. It's a fine one to make. Yeah, it's uh, a section. It was not a huge one. And I have to admit, I couldn't find that whole section either. Did anyone you know, else have that? It just was the permissions was weren't set to be to, for us to be able to open it. So when you went through sure. the board packet, it just skipped it. All right. So let's let's push both until next meeting. So I think it's this one. Uh, sorry, my sorry. No, no problem at all. I think it's that one, but then we had it in there. When yeah, I tapped yeah. it, so yeah, yeah. I can look up it too. Yeah. Um, Let's do a quick executive session to discuss a personal letter. Before we do that, I do have one question. There were there were two policies, those draft proposed changes. Do we they were they were in the I think they were board. for the benefit of the finance committee. Yeah. So oh, thank you. they're gonna come before That's we right. made a decision to bring them before the board next time so that board members have time to read thank them. Thank you. Because otherwise we would have just voted, <laughs> we would have just reviewed them and there there were at least one of them there were some changes to yep. yeah and yeah, oh. then you wouldn't have had any time to read them so thank you do they do they need three readings if, for changes or just they, yeah, they do need three readings three. for changes we we can bring them back to the policy committee this is pretty boiler yeah, yeah. for the yeah. most part and the whole board reviews them has to read it three times it's yeah, going it to be on the board again three the times yeah. okay i mean we would probably have time if you wanted to come look at it 
you know, we, we can send it. We can send it to the policy. We're committee meeting on the right. same day as the next school board meeting. Might so. it, might no, it's as, okay. Might as well send but it. But there, there will be it. three policies. Then. Well, they'll be in the board packet. So yeah, I'll put it in the board. Yeah. Well. If we want, if we want to take it up that day, we can. Yeah, the board. Yeah, the policy committee has any. Yeah, we can bring any changes to the meeting. Yeah. 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 Um, right. Do I have a motion to go into ES for personnel? I move to go into the executive session for personnel matter. Do I have a second? Second it. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Great. We'll move to 126. 